about uh, cracking the foundation, attacking Windows Communication Foundation web services. So my name is Brian Holyfield. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Gotham Digital Science. Uh, we're a security consulting firm that really does a lot of software security testing. So um, really the, the background for this talk was that uh, we're starting to see a lot more applications that use WCF for talking to either clients or uh, web clients or even other web services. And there's really a lot of gotchas when you're looking at a WCF web service that if you don't really understand uh, can really cause you to stumble when you're trying to, uh, to break one of these services. So the objective is really to go over uh, just quickly some key concepts around WCF so that you're familiar with them and then really talk about different techniques, different tools, different things you'll need to know for attacking and testing these services. So I'll spend a little bit of time very quickly on an overview um, of just a couple key things. Then we'll talk about metadata, which is, you know, like any, any web service, getting your metadata is one of the critical steps if you're going to want to then start probing and attacking the different methods that it exposes. Um, and then we'll talk about manipulating endpoints. We probably won't have time to talk about custom clients um, just because we started a little bit late. But um, if we have time, I've got some material on that as well. So kind of taking a step back, WCF is really the, the predominant framework, communications framework that Microsoft is really encouraging developers to use for all network communications. So it's been around since .NET 3. They really made a, a bunch of enhancements in 3.5. They're continuing to make enhancements even with, uh, with the newly released 4.0 framework. And really the key here is that there's a bunch of different protocols and message formatting options that WCF supports, which really renders a lot of the tools that are out there um, a bit useless when it comes to, to from a testing perspective. So this is just a quick overview of the different legacy mechanisms that .NET or Windows has for communicating with different systems. They've pretty much all been superseded by WCF. So there's really three key things that you need to know about any given WCF endpoint that you're going to, uh, to attack. So just like any other web service, you typically refer to the exposed endpoint, and there's, there's what they call the ABCs of a given endpoint, the address, the binding, and the contract. The, the address is fairly straightforward. Uh, it's in a format that you're probably familiar with, the transport with the four, uh, peer, uh, colon, forward, two forward slashes, the machine name, if there's a port number, and then an optional URI as well. Um, a lot of times if you're looking at a web server that's hosting one of these services, uh, the real easy way to tell if this is a WCF service, you know, historically .NET web services have a .ASMX web uh, file extension. The WCF services have a .SVC file extension. They don't have to, but more often than not they do. The, um, the most important thing you need to know is the binding. And the binding really dictates the, the transport protocol that the web service requires to talk to it and also the format of the messages that it's expecting to uh, receive and that it's going to send you. And there's a whole bunch of different bindings that come out of the box. Uh, and then they even give you the option to customize a binding so you can really have any combination of these transport protocols and uh, encoding formats. I think if you were to really focus on a, a, a subset of them, you're normally going to see either HTTP or HTTPS as the network uh, transport or net.tcp, which is a pure binary protocol that's a proprietary WCF uh, network protocol. And then down at the message level, um, you're either going to have, again, they've got an optimized binary format that's meant for uh, transport between two WCF or two Microsoft technologies. And then, of course, there's the... Uh, the the, the standard text-based formats like SOAP, XML, JSON, that type of thing. And then the last thing is the contract. The contract really just dictates the different methods that are exposed. At the end of the day, you really have no control over the contract. The, the developer has dictated this. So um, the only thing to note here is that by default, they've really tried to take a secure by default approach. And there is nothing that's included in a contract by default. Every method needs to be explicitly included in a service contract. So the developer, does, it's, it's difficult if they're at least crafting these classes by hand to really inadvertently expose um, different methods. So moving on to the more relevant stuff here, 
the uh, the first step in a, in in attacking any given service is doing a little reconnaissance and obtaining some metadata. So thinking back to your classic web services, uh, normally you get a WSDL, and you can do that with uh, if support for legacy WSDL is enabled on the endpoint, you can append just a question mark WSDL. It'll spit back the WSDL. The uh, the preferred mechanism for exchanging this metadata is known as MEX, which is the metadata exchange. Uh, format that's actually a, a W3C uh, spe uh, spec that's currently, I, I'm not sure if it's still in draft or not, but this is really a, a protocol that's designed specifically for exchanging metadata. It's the exact same type of metadata that you would get through the WSDL, it's just a, a slightly different way to get it. So again, out of the box, they've really tried to take this secure approach and whereas previously the WSDLs were published automatically, you had to sort of disable that um, by default, no, no metadata is published with WCF. So that's sort of the bad news from the attacker's perspective. The good news, however, is that if the developer is using Visual Studio, which 99% you know, of the time they're going to, uh, it's going to generate a web.config template for the developer, and the metadata is enabled in that template. So if they're using Visual Studio, chances are they're going to have metadata enabled unless they've gone through and actually deleted this area. You can even see where in the default template it tells you to avoid disclosing metadata. You'll want to back this setting off. So this is what a typical uh, the, the helper page looks like if you were to make a GET request to one of these endpoints. Uh, very similar to the legacy helper page with the exception that uh, doesn't actually give you the list of methods that you can drill down to. It just gives you the URL where you can obtain metadata. Now there's a couple things to note here. Um, the first is that in that default Visual Studio template, they've enabled metadata for HTTP, as you can see with the HTTP get enabled, but they have not enabled metadata over HTTPS. So the, uh, the WCF framework actually will not publish metadata if it hasn't been specifically allowed over either HTTP or HTTPS, depending on, on which uh, protocol you're using. So you can see here, this is an example of a helper page that there's a, couple act there's a couple differences here. The first is that we're accessing this over HTTPS, even though this is actually routing internally to a web server over HTTP. So this is probably using some sort of SSL accelerator. Um, if that's the case, um, we, we may or may not be able to get the metadata here. You'll also notice that the host name is different, and that's because the, uh, the, what, the endpoint's going to actually publish the local Windows host name of that device. So if you're trying to obtain metadata and it's not working, those are a couple quick things to pay attention to, is whether the protocol is right and whether the host name is right. And you can easily use one of those intercepting proxies like Burp to uh, just do a find and replace on the, uh, on the protocol and the host name uh, and, and take off that additional port as well. So I mentioned before that uh, obtaining metadata through, through MEX is fairly straightforward. It's just going to take a slightly different um, request structure. And the way you do that typically is through a post request to the endpoint, followed with um, the developer has to explicitly include the path to the MEX endpoint. So in this case, it's slash MEX. That's the default one that Visual Studio creates. So again, in, in virtually every time I've run into a WCF web service, it publishes metadata with a slash MEX endpoint. So if that's the case, uh, this is pretty much the request that you would use to get that information. Uh, there's really only two pieces that I've highlighted there that you're going to need to change from the verbatim example that we've got here, uh, not including the host header, if this is a virtual host. So it's pretty straightforward, and again, that's going to dump the WSDL um, right back at you. Another option for obtaining metadata, which is a newer option that's only supported in uh, version 4 of the framework that just came out, is what's called WS Discovery. This is actually, again, another standard for, uh, for dynamic discovery of endpoints on a network. It's an open protocol, and there's really two ways, two models that you can use WS Discovery. Um, in any case, it all operates over UDP, and what happens is as a web server service comes up on the network or goes down on the network, it actually announces itself 
through hello and goodbye messages that broadcast over UDP to the local subnet. And then all of the other, if, it, if this is running in ad hoc mode, all of the web services are, are listening for these hello and goodbye messages. They can also send a probe request looking for web services on that subnet. Um, the only difference between ad hoc and managed mode is that in managed mode, there's actually a central directory server that's used to, uh, to record all of these hello and goodbye announcements uh, and service all of the probe and resolve requests. So this is something that you may not be able to use over the internet, specifically because it's typically 